you. Thanks for tuning in to today's webinar, Raising Monarchs. Um, the first part of the topic of monarch butterflies was shown actually on May 26, and it was called Planting for Monarchs. So if you were able to join then, I'm hoping maybe you were able to incorporate some pollinator plants and milkweed into your gardening space. And I believe you can go back and look at that uh, video and watch it um, on the internet. So let's get started. There are some important things to think about before you're even starting to raise monarchs. And whether you've raised them in the past or you're just getting started, I'm hoping to cover some of those important topics. I've been raising monarchs for almost 10 years now, and I find it really amazing and rewarding. So first is the location where you plan to raise the monarch from egg to butterfly. Outdoors is a great example um, to do raising because that's where they do this in the natural. But a screen porch with a morning sun and a shady afternoon is really great. It needs to be covered to protect your, your cages, your mess, mesh cages from rain with a raised surface like a table or a shelf and a door to keep out any cats or dogs or raccoons or other crit critters. This gives your larva and your chrysalis fresh air and it protects it from the harsh elements. I raise my monarchs indoors and it's important to have a quiet room or space away from a lot of loud, loud noise or activity, and one that's climate controlled. So no fans, but you don't want it too hot or too cold, just like a, a good indoor climate controlled room. If you have a sunny window, that's great because that'll allow in some uh, plenty of natural light. Um, whether you do it indoors or outdoors, it's important not to use any chemicals around your monarchs, because this will affect their development and likely kill them. So what am I talking about? Indoors, this includes things like hairspray, perfume, room deodorants, and even dis diffusing some essential oils into the room affects them. Um, so uh, an essential oil like cinnamon can break down the skeletal system of an insect. And monarchs are included in that. It doesn't discriminate. So think about that. Also, one thing that happened with me that I had no idea was we put some flea tick control on our cats. And we had one indoor cat and this affected the growing caterpillars. I wasn't aware of it and I didn't know what was wrong with my caterpillar and I had to really research and talk to other people. And that flea and tick control, what it does is it um, stops development of fleas um, and that's what it did to the caterpillars. So you have to be really mindful of that. Um, so it means making an important commitment for your garden too. So when you release your monarchs, you don't want to put chemicals on to kill your caterpillars or butterflies or bees or other important poll pollinators. So this is um, a picture of some mesh um, monarch cages. And you can see I have quite a few <laughs> right there. When I get going, I can, I can raise 800 caterpillars, raise and release 800 monarchs um, a summer. So I can get going pretty good and get, you know, 30 of these um, mesh cages going. I used an aquarium my first year, which is great. Um, it's, it's good for one caterpillar, but I found out that it wasn't big enough for more than that. And it wasn't real easy to clean. These I purchase online. Um, they're about $10 each the last time I checked. And they are really great, easy to clean. They provide, you can see lots of fresh air uh, for the monarchs and no insects can get in. It's like a, mos a soft mosquito netting and you can see the zippers so you can easily get in and out of them. 
One thing with um, the zippers though, is you always have to look behind the cage because you might have a caterpillar on the line of that zipper and you don't want to zip it open. Um, I also use uh, paper towels in abundance. <laughs> I put a paper towel on the bottom and one across the top. So they have like a little bit of cover on the top um, and keeping the cages clean are so important. Next, as you might imagine, is an ample supply of milkweed. This is, you're lo actually looking at my kitchen here. These, this is swamp milkweed. It grows native on our um, creek. We have a big creek. So I am really fortunate to have an ample supply of milkweed. Now, if you're just getting started, just try with one. If you find a caterpillar outside, just try with one and just see how it works for you. These I like because it's a branching milkweed and it goes in um, a jar of filtered water and this milkweed will stay fresh like this uh, for a few days, three, maybe four days. You can, uh, this is more of the milkweed and this is what I easily use in one day because I have so many, um, caterpillars going on. You'll find eggs when you bring in milkweed, you'll find eggs. And so you have to keep an eye out for that. This milkweed, if you don't um, have the branch milkweed, if you have the common milkweed, you can lay it on in between moist paper towels, um, lay it flat between moist paper towels, and you can like layer that up and put it in a a big Ziploc baggie and put it in the fridge. And those will last for a few days too. So don't worry if you don't have the branched swamp milkweed, that's not a problem. So let's get ready for your adventure. We're gonna talk about every stage from the, of the monarch from the egg to the butterfly. So the monarch eggs are quite small and I like, when I see them, I like to cut them out of the, carefully cut them off of the milkweed and put them on a moist paper towel with the egg up. Do you all see the eggs? I'm, I'm sure you see the little white eggs. Once you identify eggs, you're gonna be able to find them every time you're looking for milkweed. They're really obvious. They're on the underside of the leaf um, because that's the way the monarch lays her eggs. She sits on the top and puts her abdomen, bends it over and plops the egg up underneath the leaf. On occasion, I'll find one on the upper side, but 99% of the time, this is the way that I see them. Now, I'll put these in like a big Tupperware and actually close the lid. <laughs> and it doesn't, you're not you're not um, taking any oxygen or anything away from them. They'll hatch in three days. So you can see them this way easily. You can see when the caterpillar um, hatches in its little tiny thing. Let's take a look. Um, this is common milkweed. I wanted to show you this. So in the top right corner, you'll see kind of a creamy colored egg. That was just laid. So. It goes cr uh, creamy colored to white that you'll see down on the kind of the left milkweed. And then on the bottom, you can see where the caterpillar has come out and you can see the white, the um, milkweed substance, that's where it's chewed, it's already starting to chew and eat. So that's a clue. You could take all three of these inside and raise three monarchs. So there are five stages the caterpillar goes through. Each stage is called an instar, and that's the caterpillar developing. So with each stage, you can see in this picture, I almost got all five stages. You can see small all the way up to big in the bottom. That's a fifth instar caterpillar. So you can see how big that they grow. And they're they look a little bit different. So with every stage, they'll hold really still and then they'll wiggle out of their skin and then they actually eat their skin and then they're bigger and brighter and really cool looking.
This is the fifth instar of a caterpillar, and you can see how big it is next to a penny. Here's a, a fifth instar out. On the left slide, it shows one actually on the milkweed. It's not real common that I, that I see a fifth instar out in the milkweed. This one I would still bring in and put in a cage all by itself so it can go ahead and go through its next stages. And then the one on the right is looks like it's eating some um, really pretty tropical milkweed in the flower. I think their feet look like they have tennis shoes on them. <laughs> so the milk, uh, the caterpillar will go into its fifth instar and then it will find a place on the top of the cage and it'll hold still for a really long time. With every stage of instar from the first to the fifth, it does that. So sometimes you think, what's wrong with my caterpillar? There's nothing wrong. There's nothing wrong, don't worry. It's just resting and it's actually developing and, and slowly morphing um, from stage to stage. So what it does is it goes on the top and it'll spit out um, some silk and you'll see its head moving back and forth. And I call it a little silk button. And then it walks over the top and it attaches itself with what's called a cremaster. It's at the, the, the tail end of it and it'll hook on there and it will um, hang, it'll drop down and hang. Okay, so you see on the left, it looks kind of like a J. If you, it looks like a backwards J, but they call that a J. It's just a common name. It will stay like that for, it could stay 12 hours and usually it happens overnight. Um, so you have to be very, very careful not to disturb it because it's really going through some incredible changes inside. And then it will drop down, you see the next um, caterpillar, it'll kind of drop down, its antennas will look, go straight down and the skin will split behind its head um, at its head, I call it unzipping, and it'll wiggle its way out of the skin. And you can see here where the wings have already started developing. So where you see like towards the bottom of where it's all gooey in the inside of it, those are the wings already developing. The whole thing maybe takes um, a couple of minutes at the most, but you can see it wiggling out. And it's in that silk at the top holds that so tight. So this is called a chrysalis. It's not a cocoon, it's a chrysalis. And it wiggles, wiggles, and then it'll stop. So there you go. And in about 20 minutes, it will look like this jade like this. It's so beautiful. You'll see like little gold marks on the front of it, the bottom and across the top there. Those are actually ports of entry for oxygen. The chrysalis will hang for exactly nine days. And all the years I've been doing it, it's exactly nine days. So you can mark your calendar so you know, you just need to leave it alone. There's nothing you need to do. Um, chrysalis comes from the Greek word for gold. So this is so beautiful. Um, this chrysalis goes transparent the morning and just minutes before it's going to eclose. So it's gonna come out of this chrysalis and you can see those wings. And I just think this is the prettiest part. It kind of looks like um, fancy jewelry to me. <laughs> now, when they're transparent and you see the wings, stay close because it's gonna stay close if you wanna see it come out. 
So it will crack open, the chrysalis will crack open and the butterfly will drop down. And you can see it can take four or five minutes. It's not super close. So you have to be really patient and wait. The monarch's gonna hold, when it comes out, it's gonna hold really tight onto that chrysalis. You don't wanna bump the cage. You don't want it to drop down because those wings are all curled up. You can see where the body is really big and full of fluid. And the butterfly is pump, gonna pump the fluid out of the body into the wings and it'll rock back and forth, and it'll um, move the fluid from the body to the wings. And within five minutes or so, you'll see the monarch completely full on the right. It's just amazing. Also, the tongue or the proboscis, you can see it in the middle one, kind of out and curled, that's in two, that's split. So you'll watch the monarch roll that out and in and out and in, and it's fusing that proboscis together. If the proboscis doesn't fu fuse together, it can't sip the nectar out of a flower. So it does all this on its own. And I think it's just so amazing. I think we're gonna watch one maybe. You can see it crack open and the body comes out and then the wings. This is the probably my first monarch because this is when it was in a um, aquarium and I had a stick, I had sticks in there for them. It's a male, this one's a male and you can see the little glands on its wings. I'll show you on another slide. So if you leave your butter, butterfly alone, sometimes I'll move the cage to a, a sunny window. In 20 minutes, it's actually ready to fly. And it will tell you, um, you will know because it will walk away um, from, it will walk away from the um, chrysalis and it'll start walking around the mesh cage and it'll start, taking its wings and opening them up and fluttering them back and forth. Um, I usually wait until the afternoon. I just let it stay inside and then I release them the same day. The only exception is um, when it's raining really hard or if it's super windy and not a very nice day, I'll keep it overnight, but I try not to keep them too long because they just need to go. This is a um, picture of, it looks like there's five or six of them in there. And it, I think it's a video. Let's see if it works for us. You can see them, they are ready to go. They're like, let us out. Um, this time of the year, I release six or seven a day. So the monarch butterfly is really a social creature. My phone is filled with pictures like this because they will turn and look at you and you can see this butterfly looking at you. Some of them will stay on my hand. You can see one on my finger and that one's behind my ear just hanging out. Some of them will just hang out with me for a while. Um, on a rare occasion, um, they don't, they just don't want to go. And I have to kind of take them to a flower and, and force them on the flower. Uh, monarchs have 12 eyes. 
and they're highly sensitive to color and movement, but they don't really see well. So they can see the color and they can see you moving and will turn to them. The sensors on the end of those antennas help them with their balance. It detects motion and the sun and the, net and the atmosphere so they can navigate. And they, it also picks up scents of flowers or even another mate. Okay, let's see. This monarch is a male, and you can tell by on the underside if you see the, if you start at the bottom and look up, there's two veins up. You see like a little black, it looks like a spot. And those are the, thank you, Amy. Um, those are the glands that secrete the pheromones to attract the females. The females, um, their veins are a little bit thicker and they don't have that, that um, gland right there. This is a Mexican sunflower and it's one of the, their favorites in my garden. So you can see his proboscis going down in and sipping the nectar. And he doesn't mind me filming him. Now this monarch, you'll see a tag on it. So I am, am a member in, with Monarch Watch. If you go to monarchwatch.org, Org online, you can order um, all kinds of things. Um, you can order actually milkweed plugs and extension agents can order them and get a, a tray of plugs for free. So if you want more information about that, give me a contact. These tags, so you have to purchase them and you have to purchase a minimum of 25. You keep record of the monarchs that you tag down in Mexico, um, there are people that look for those tags uh, on the monarchs, and then they can go in and they can. You can see this. This is from last year. The the number at the bottom there. They can type that in, and they can see who who uh, raised that monarchs and released it, and they contact you. And I have had. Probably over the years, I don't do it every year because sometimes, honestly, I forget to get my tags and you can only get them up to a certain time. Um, some, sometimes uh, I'll get the notification in the next year. It'll be the next year, like in January or so. And I've had um, close to 20 that they've notified me about. It doesn't mean that not all of them have made it, but those are the ones that someone has identified. And so it gives me, um, you know, I, it's really rewarding to know that I've helped monarchs and they have made it all the way back to Mexico. This is a monarch that's down on my creek and it's um, in the, now it's in nature. Hopefully it's gonna mate. Monarchs will begin mating when they're three to eight days old and they remain with their mates for about 16 hours. One female can lay up to 500 eggs. Um, of those laid out, those eggs out in nature, about three out of a hundred will survive because there's just a lot of predators that like to eat the eggs or even the caterpillars, ants and bee, other beetles, spiders, um, praying mantis. They have all kinds of predators that uh, love to eat them. So what, with my success, I've been really successful. I've done better every, every year. I do a little bit better, but I have about a 99% um, survival rate. And sometimes the ones that don't make it are things that are not because I, that I just can't help. For example, when a caterpillar's in the wild, 
the tacit fly can lay an egg underneath their scales and it's so tiny you don't see it and it will develop and become bigger and bigger and go into a chrysalis and then when it's a chrysalis that egg will hatch into a larva inside the chrysalis and ba basically eat the chrysalis. So there's really you know, nothing you can do about that. The other time I've lost a chrysalis is when I told you earlier about the, our animals, our cats having um, flea and tick on them and that stopped, that helped stop the whole process. It never went from the J into the chrysalis, it just got stuck. So um, mostly it's really successful. I would love to have more people um, enjoy this. It's great with people of all ages. You know, I go from young kids, my grandkids started doing it when they were really young and they do it now on their own up until, you know, adults that have not a clue about the monarchs being um, kind of in a state where they're declining in their population. So it's always rewarding for people of all ages.